Hi, everybody. Uh, I'd like to ask to take your seat, please. Um, welcome. Uh, first of all, please um, put your cell phones on silent uh, and a number of other items I'd like to mention. Uh, uh, all attendees uh, will be sent an email letting them know that uh, when the post-convention evaluation form is available uh, for the input, uh, uh, and so please take uh, the time to complete the survey. Um, it's used heavily by all committee chairs, so thank you. And there's also a party tonight, obviously, you know, at nine o'clock uh, in the here in the Maryland ballroom, so come, it's gonna be fun. Uh, we're gonna have a DJ and uh, a lot of uh, other things. So in fourth, uh, please um, stay seated at the end of the presidential address. We will then present Bob with a plaque uh, as a token of uh, our appreciation for his uh, terrific work for the organization over the past year, so thank you. Um, well, uh, how can I introduce Bob? So I like to um, fill you in on my research that I conducted. And uh, it started with this recent article. Uh, you might be familiar with it. Uh, you can't read it, but it's just fine. Uh, but this is the group uh, that he worked with uh, on the dissemination task force. And uh, I started with this picture to kind of get a better sense of Bob, uh, the gentleman in the middle. Uh, and this is another more pictures from 1972, so Bob as a new chair in the Department of Psychology at North Dakota State. Um, and uh, Bill, uh, Dr. Mackey uh, said that was the start of Bob's academic career, and under his leadership the department grew uh, to fast forward the research juggernaut it has become. Now I'd like to juxtapose these two pictures, so Bob in 2012 versus Bob in 1972. So what, what do you see as the major difference? I'd like, <laughs> like you to, to point, uh, uh, point your attention to this uh, necklace, <laughs> which I still don't understand why he had a necklace around here. But um, so just uh, let me, let me uh, fill you in on some, some important timelines of his career. Uh, born in, on February 28th um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, he then um, graduated in 1960 from Holy Name High School and uh, received the best camper award. <laughs> in 64, he graduated from John Carroll University, Psychology and Journalism, and in 69 from Kent State. Uh, and. Uh, 69 to 72, he was a member of the SPEBSQSA, the Society for the Preservation and Encouragement of Barbershop Quartet Singing in America, Incorporated. <laughs> I hope you're going to hear something tonight. The old song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please hold your applause. <laughs> From 85 to 2007, uh, he was the psychology training director at Wilford Hall Medical Center, and uh, in 2007, the research associate professor and, uh, at the University of Texas uh, Health Science Center in San Antonio. Oh, this was interesting. I obviously used Facebook as, uh, as a source of, uh, of um, this information. In 2010, there was a Facebook entry uh, that he, uh, uh, he joined Facebook, and apparently he indicated that he got married in 2010. And interestingly, in August uh, of uh, 7th, he, he celebrated his 45th wedding anniversary. I think this really suggests also how speedy he is. It's like time means nothing. Now, what do we know about Bob? We know he's the boss, but what about Bob? Well, he is the do you want to have a piece of me, Bob? This is a, uh, seems to be a birthday cake on his lap. Uh, so, right, so what about Bob? Well, Bob is always right because he's Bob and Bob is always right. Of course, I'm right, I'm Bob. Uh, he's the dude, the scholar, the entrepreneur par excellence, Klepek University. Uh, he's wearing many hats, many hats, <laughs> many hats, many hats, many hats. 
And uh, I'd like to sh uh, thank Sharon Barry, Mark Zuckerberg, for providing this information. And now let the wild rumpus begin. Thank you, Stefan, I think. <laughs> um, I'd like to say thank you, too, to all of you who are here, friends, colleagues, uh, ABCT staff, and some special guests. Uh, I have my daughter, Terry, here. Would you stand, please? <clears throat> Her husband, Andrew. And two of my delightful grandkids, Sydney. <laughs> and Jackson, who's busy sucking on his bottle. I don't know if he's going to wave at you. And last but not least, my wife, uh, my supporter in all things and partner in most. Uh, love, you, love you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, as I was getting ready for, uh, for this. <laughs> I started the day after the election working on this talk. Um, and I didn't like the direction it was taking. And I was thinking, where, where should I go with this? And at the same time, we were working on the task force uh, to uh, come up with some standards, some suggestions and recommendations for doctoral training in CBT and psychology departments. And I thought, wow, how far we've come. How far we've come. And I thought, I wonder if people realize not only how far we've come, but how fast we've come that far. Uh, I'm still old enough to walk and talk, sometimes at the same time, and yet I saw most of this field develop. And I thought it might be good to just take a quick look at how far we've come, and then to ask, what do we need to do if we're going to make similar progress in the next 47 years? So that's the, basically the substance of what I'm going to do. Uh, these are the places I hang out uh, when my wife lets me out of the house. <clears throat> and again, I'll start with personal reflections, and I underscore personal. It's not going to be a comprehensive history, uh, just things that I, I think uh, impressed me and, and uh, in, had an impression on me. <clears throat> a little bit of prehistory. Before I got started graduate school, I was uh, alive at this point, but between 7 and 17. And I put Carl Rogers up there for two reasons. One, my major professor was trained by Snyder, who was a student of Carl Rogers. And secondly, he made, I think he played a very, very important role for us who are interested in doing research in therapy. Um, as you read the, the, the uh, quote here, therapists had never let anyone listen in, let alone measure and compare. Rogers said, we must do it, and he did, and he was castigated for it. You're breaking the sanctity of the relationship in that office. You're going to hurt people. He didn't. He did a nice job. <clears throat> the first time we saw operant principles being systematically and programmatically applied to human problems was in 1953. B.F. Skinner started the Harvard Research Lab. The first known term, uh, use of the term behavior therapy by Lindsley, Skinner, and Solomon was also in that same year. Now, in 65, I started a master's program in experimental psychology at Kent State University, continued into the third uh, PhD class in clinical psychology, along with Barry Lubetkin, a classmate who's in the audience. Um, the faculties in both experimental and clinical psychology encouraged the interest that we had in the application of experimental findings and principles to clinical problems. But there wasn't a single behavior therapist in the, on the faculty. Why is that? They didn't, there weren't any. There were, there were very few people. In the, ABCT was not founded until the year after 
I began graduate school. And thank you, founding parents. <clears throat> I like this quote, actually, Frank Andrasik used it a couple of years ago. Uh, but when she heard that we had grown to uh, membership of past 5,000, Dr. Suskind said, marvelous, just marvelous. When the organization started in 1966, we were battling the image of brainwashing being compared to Clockwork Orange. The founding members would meet in Dorothy's studio apartment. The program for the first ABC convention in 1967 was six pages. At that time, and this was again when I entered graduate school, I was shocked at, uh, at what I had seen because here was an area where they were really trying to apply psychological findings to clinical problems as opposed to going over here to the classroom and studying experimental psychology, then going over here to the clinic and doing things that had no relationship to what was going on there. Um, why in the world at this point in time weren't we doing more of that? Well, I thought Dr. Gelder's talk at the uh, awards banquet or award ceremony yesterday was instructive. He was saying that when he came over here from England to talk and uh, learn more about what was going on in the United States, he was shocked, Dr. Dr. Gelder's a psychiatrist, he was shocked that American psychiatry was castigating behavior therapy and behavior modification. That we were talking, we, we were told that um, not only was it superficial, not only was it um, treating symptoms rather than causes, but it was harming people because since you didn't treat those psychodynamic causes, the symptoms you got rid of, which were the most economical ones the person could come up with on their own, were going to be replaced by other symptoms. And those symptoms would probably be worse for the person than the ones that you got rid of. Oh my gosh, that's where we were in 1966. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the uh, events and that caught my interest. And while doing that, I'm going to show you the past presidents of the ABCT. <clears throat> 1967, the first ever ABCT, I'm sorry, AABT convention was held. Aaron Beck published Cognitive Therapy for Depression. 68, Walter Michelle publishes his monograph, Personality and Assessment. Why is that important to me? When we studied personality in graduate school, we studied trait theories, we studied type theories, we studied psychodynamic theories, and they really had no bearing on the kind of things I was interested in clinically. Michelle changed that. He came up with a social cognitive theory that had direct relevance to what we do clinically. <clears throat> in 69, the year I received my PhD, Volpe and Reyna founded the Journal of Behavior Therapy and Experimental Psychiatry. And the next year, in 70, the first issue of Behavior Therapy came out with Cyril Franks as editor. Um, that sounds, yeah, that's nice. The reason they both started was because it couldn't get published in the, in the other journals that existed at the time. They had a heck of a time getting behavior modification, behavior therapy studies published. So we started our own journals. In 75, I had my first AB, AABT convention, which was their ninth annual meeting. <clears throat> in 1976, Alan Kasdan and Linda Craighead Wilcoxon published a review of the literature of systematic desensitization. Why is that important? This was the first time we found uh, a, enough of a literature with outcome research to actually warrant a review. In 75, 77, the first issue of Cognitive Therapy and Research was published, and Bandera published his hallmark social learning theory. Personality is an interaction between three com components, the environment, behavior, and one's psychological processes. Again, great discontinuity from the kinds of things we had been taught early on in graduate school. <clears throat> 81, Arnold Lazarus published the, the practice of multimodal behavior therapy. 1991, Marshall Linehan publishes papers establishing DBT as a treatment for borderline personality. And think about those dates and how long ago that was. It was yesterday. 1993, as president of Division 12, David Barlow commissioned a task force on empirically supported treatments. Actually, they call it empirically validated treatments and backpedaled quickly. Uh, empirically, empirically supported treatments under Diane Chambliss's direction. People have very mixed reactions to this. Uh, th they published a list of therapies that met the criteria that they had established for calling them empirically supported. Whatever your opinion about, and there are problems with that, whatever your opinion though, 
I heard more talk about outcome research and outcomes of psychotherapy. I heard more talk of, against the old dodo hypothesis, saying they not, all therapies are not the same. They differ in terms of how clearly we know that they do what they're supposed to do. So it was really a very important thing, whether or not you like the specific things that came out of it. <clears throat> 1994, Cognitive and Behavioral Practice published, published its first edition with Lizette Peterson as editor. 2003, yesterday or this afternoon, Steve Hayes, Kirk Strassel, Kelly Wilson published Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, an Experiential Approach to Behavior Change. 2010, Frank Andrasik formalized ABC's, ABCT's commitment to dissemination of behavioral and cognitive treatment. And as you looked at those pictures, I don't know I know the late data don't support it, but I look at those, t those people, our past presidents, and they have an aura about them. They have the way they dress, the way they carry themselves. They just seem to exude seriousness of purpose, intelligence, and so on. <clears throat> at least most of them. Okay, uh, just a few snippets. Now, you, you, I've given you a little bit of the then. You know the now. But I found some interesting uh, then and now comparisons that I thought you might, uh, you might find intriguing. ABT membership in 1966 was just under 60. And to 2010, we peaked at 5,088. And this year and last, we're just under 5,000. Conventions, I found this interesting. In 67, the year first convention, there were 40 presentations. In 1991, 750. This year, approximately 4,000. This was also interesting. These are, I'll just let you look, scan those numbers. Um, I chose kind of historical interest, uh, other psych psychotherapies as a comparison, but the, the, the numbers of hits uh, on Google for cognitive behavior therapy, behavior therapy and related issues is far beyond any of those for psychoanalytic or thought field therapy or client-centered therapy. In 1969 and 70, as I mentioned, behavior therapy and behavior therapy and experimental psychiatry were founded to counter problems in finding journals in which to publish behavior therapy articles. Here's just a partial top of the head list of current journals that cater specifically to cognitive and or behavioral therapy. There are many more and any reputable journal that deals with behavior change behavior therapy articles are welcome. We have flourished over the past 47 years. We've overcome a lot of obstacles in getting there. There's much more to be done. What can we do to encourage similar or greater progress over the next 47 years? And when I told my uh, daughter Terry that this is what I was going to talk about, she said, yeah, according to you. Well, yeah, okay, according to me. <laughs> this one should go without saying, but it doesn't. Remember the basics of our science approach. <clears throat> the first one, we are, I say it's almost too effective that we do base our assessments and treatment decisions on the best available research. The reason I say almost too effective is now, one of the reasons we did that um, task force on doctoral training in, in cognitive and behavioral therapy is because if you do a Google search and search for cognitive behavioral therapy or some variation of it, and doctoral training. Look and see what you come up with. Your programs will not be there. There are many that have adopted this as it's, hey, it's popular, you know, people are interested in this, uh, let, let's do it. So they've got the name, they don't have the substance. <clears throat> we also have a, a, a rise in pseudoscience where people claim to have the empirical support that we, I think we have legitimately uh, but if you look closely at it, it's not true. And I think it's important that we teach students to make those distinctions. We have to stay aware of evolving philosophies of science, and I thank James Herbert for this. In the course of putting together that document on uh, training in CBT, um, we had a lot of discussion about this, and one of the clear things was that we have a couple of major philosophies of science that share a lot but differ some. And unless you understand those differences, you get into arguments about what is really considered uh, reasonable evidence, what is not. Uh, we need to make sure that people understand there are differences, that the philosophy of science, like CBT, evolves over time, and that these are important pre-research assumptions 
that you need to know if you're going to understand one another and talk and evolve the, the, the system. Again, all this stuff, I'm preaching to the choir. But the reason I decided to include it was, were a couple of things, not the least of which is, I love our listserv. But you get on that listserv and somebody says, geez, I need help with this kind of a problem. I've got a client coming in next week and I'm not sure exactly how to play it. Some of the suggestions you see, ah, that's a ABCT listserv. Fortunately, we have a number of members, and I implore you to be among them, who will come on and gently say, well, that's an interesting viewpoint. The literature I'm familiar with suggests this. So it's something we, that, that is so much the heart of ABCT that even though I'm preaching to the choir, I think it's worth mentioning. Another thing I think uh, is important to our directions is to reach beyond psychiatric diagnoses. I don't want to uh, belabor this. Um, I do want to just get across the point that the medical model and its embedded system of psychiatric diagnoses constitute a conceptual model and one that is not without conceptual problems. If you want to see just a few of the many, many articles that have been published on there on the conceptual problems with the system, there they are. I'm not going to belabor them. Aside from the conceptual problems, there are practical problems. First of all, obviously, psychiatric diagnosis is, is critical in today's world. If you're practicing in a medical facility or you hope to get insurance payments, you must use psychiatric diagnoses. The psychiatric diagnoses that you apply can have major impact on the lives of the people who are being diagnosed. So it has to be taken seriously. As my four-year-old granddaughter, who's not here today, said to me, or said to her mother, uh, her mom was complaining about her teenage sister's behavior in one context or another, and my four-year-old, without looking up from her ice cream, said, Mom, that's your reality. <laughs> I don't know whose kid that is. <clears throat> Treatment can be denied for serious problems if you go to a medical facility and no diagnosis is applied. Uh, it constrains topics that might be productively studied. If we really s limited ourselves to psychiatric diagnoses, there would be no clinical health psychology. There would be no sports psychology. I don't know where your creative genius may take the field in areas outside of those defined as problems by the psychiatric community. The principles of psychology have, can be and have been applied not only to alleviate problems, but to enhance strengths. That doesn't fit within a diagnostic model. <laughs> and as an old saw, it's one of the rationales for having a psychiatric diagnostic system is to facilitate communication, especially in research, but clinically as well. So you don't have to go through lengthy descriptions of uh, what the, what the, what's wrong with this person. You can simply use the diagnostic label, except it doesn't communicate that well. Every one of us who has, who has worked in this area for any number of years has seen two people with the same diagnoses who look totally different when, in terms of the behavior they're actually emitting, the factors that are supporting it, and the factors that might be useful in changing it. A psychiatric diagnosis, from for our perspective as behavior therapists and co cognitive therapists, does not preclude the need to do a careful functional analysis, defining the problem clearly in behavioral terms or behavioral reference if we're dealing with uh, unobservables and to the, the, the factors that are maintaining the problems and the principles or procedures that might be productively applied to help. I don't want to get off and you know, disparage the, uh, the diagnostic system. I, <laughs> I had a quote from Albee that did that quite well. But the point here for our purposes is simply to remember it is a conceptual system. You are not dealing with a disease that has a bacterium or a virus running around the body. You're dealing with a conceptual system intended to help us in understanding what we do and in predicting, making new predictions that are born out scientifically. Whether it succeeds or fails is an open question. And there are alternative models. Some, some call them social learning models. Another direction, focus on principles of the compass for CBT, principles of behavior change. To quote a uh, soon-to-be-famous psychologist, Jeff Goody wrote this for the uh, introduction to the convention. The ABCT mission statement doesn't say that behavior, uh, cognitive and behavior therapies are applying procedures to problems. It says that what we are doing is investigating and ap applying behavioral, cognitive, and other evidence-based principles to the assessment, prevention, 
and treatment of human problems. Let me tell you the excitement of those early days in the 1960s. I've told you the problems. The excitement, though, when you actually saw something from the laboratory being taken and applied clinically and actually have data that it does what you say it does. It was incredibly exciting. Um, and I think at that point in time, you had people like Skinner and his students, Volpe, Bandura, who were taking principles from their laboratories and applying them. So there was really no question about searching for principles that are responsible for the, the changes that occurred. There were efforts, and I think appropriately so, and there will be if you articulate the principles you believe are behind it, that may change the notions that we have about what those principles are. Uh, but it was just an incredibly exciting time to see um, psychological research being applied to clinical problems, bridging that old experimental clinical split. Later progress, randomly controlled trials assessing the effectiveness of treatment became the gold standard. Rigorous definition of the therapist procedures. If you're going to test a therapy, you better be very clear about what it is that constitutes that therapy and then be able to look at it and say, yes, it's really there in that research program. That condition does capture the essence of that therapy. <clears throat> and parenthetically, those manuals that were developed to be sure that in research the treatments were being applied correctly became treatment manuals that can be used clinically to, again, be sure you're applying the treatment as it's intended. Today, outcome research and clear definition of therapy procedures remain as important as they ever were. But articulation of principles has taken a kind of a back seat to those uh, uh, outcome measures, outcome studies, and definitions of procedures. <clears throat> if you're going to treat non-responders, the best treatment is not going to have a 100% success rate. What do you do when you have someone who doesn't respond as the literature suggests they should? There are people, I don't think in this room, but among us, who would say, then you don't treat them. I disagree. But if you don't reconceptualize the case in another way and use the principles you know that govern human behavior and behavior change, what else do you do? I don't know. Treating problems for which no specific treatment has yet been supported through outcome studies. You conceptualize the case based on principles or what? I don't know. The appropriate use, clinical use of treatment manuals requires an understanding of the principles underlying the steps in the procedure. Um, if you've taught um, in internships or graduate students to use manuals, you, you, they quickly learn, hey, wait a minute, on page 23 it says the person's supposed to do this and they didn't do it. What do I do? If you don't know the principles underlying step, that, that step on page 23, there's no answer to that. Wing it. If you understand the principles that were being used and applied in trying to get that change that you didn't see, you may find alternative ways to do it. So I think that even the appropriate use of treatment manuals it requires attention to principles. <clears throat> One prominent researcher, I didn't clear this with him and it was a verbal quote, so I didn't even want to cite him as a personal communication, but um, you'd know him. <laughs> And he said to me at one point, when I he was actually congratulating him because I loved the research that he did, he always did really rigorously controlled outcome studies, but always had an element in there that would help you understand more about the problem that was being treated and or the mechanisms of change that were operating to bring those outcomes about. And I congratulated him on that. He said, I'm not doing that anymore. I said, what? He said, it's a horse race and it's one that's not helpful. He says, I published these things that treatment A worked better than treatment B by so much, and the reason behind it are these principles, and all people talk about is that treatment A does better than treatment B, and they don't even pay attention to the principles. It's the principles we need to develop, and that's where my research is going from this point on. There's a symposium tomorrow uh, with some names you might recognize, uh, and I saw in the abstract uh, this quote. Because many of these cognitive and behavioral therapy interventions have been found to be equally effective, the notion of conceptual, procedural, and methodological overlap needs to be addressed. I agree. I couldn't agree more. Where do we get these principles that we're supposed to be applying? First of all, don't overlook the basics. Even though we've gone in some ways beyond it, people, it's classical conditioning principles still operate the way they did in the 1960s, and so do operant principles. 
Many modern interventions rest on these basics, at least in part. Otherwise, there are two avenues for articulating principles related to interventions. Informal observation leads to an effective treatment, and then the principles explaining their effects are sought. So I can walk through the forest and notice the changes in light patterns as I walk through may uh, bring about some state that I think is useful therapeutically and then try to figure out why that's the case. Uh, on the other hand, one can start with, a, with principles derived from the li laboratory, I almost said library, um, and say, you know, these might be useful clinically. Let's see if they work. If they work, you know what the principles are and what the mechanism to change are, at least as according to the status of our science at the time. I had an interesting experience uh, as I was working on this part of the talk. Uh, Dick Bootson came out to Wilford Hall and gave a talk on uh, insomnia. And he's put together a package called CBTI, Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia, that has four components in it. Um, two of those components have not fared very well in the research when looked at independently. They, they do seem to enhance the, uh, the package as a whole when they're added together with the other two. The other two, one is um, sleep restriction, which came about serendipitously. People working with, sl with sleep disorders said, hey, you know, what if we did this? And it, it seems to work. They're still searching for the principles that you can uh, use to understand why that works. And the last one was stimulus control, where, and this is Bootson. And it has, it has performed so robustly by itself as part of the package, and it came directly from the stimulus control literature in operant psychology. What if we did this, and it works, and I think we know why. We know the principles. Which is the better way? There's a guy named Jerry Davison who might be familiar with. Uh, I found this quote. The important part of it is, the, the, the behavior therapy approach, moving from experimentally established principles of change to novel and effective clinical applications, is an inadequately explored strategy for developing new therapeutic procedures. That from the outset, we will have known mechanisms of change because such research begins with the principles of change. <clears throat> dissemination, dissemination, dissemination. That was Frank Andrasik's title of uh, one of his presidential columns in The uh, Behavior Therapist. How do we get from these wonderful laboratory studies that we do and the clinical trials that we do to the point where people are actually using them in their practice when they haven't been trained in them in the first place? Um, we have to find ways of approaching that that go beyond the one-day workshops. I think there's no organization that does a better job in putting together really high-quality, excellent workshops in our area than ABCT. The literature suggests, however, that this can go a long way in changing what people know, but doesn't go a long way in changing what people actually do in their practice. We need to find, and we need to find ways of getting past that point. I mentioned Tony Zeiss's invited address describing successful dissemination of empirically based treatments within the Veterans Administration. We are trying this week, this, this convention, I hope we're trying it, uh, a workshops plus where we're adding consultations at four points after the workshop is presented, run by the same people presenting the workshop so that people in the clinics who are trying these things out have a place to go. We can't call it supervision, that carries some liability. But it's a chance to come back and say, I'm trying this, and here's what's happening, and I'm not sure how to approach it. Five people at a time on a, a teleconference to work past that point. I don't know whether it will work. I don't know whether we'll get people willing to, to try it. But if that doesn't work, we must find ways to get beyond the weekend workshop. workshop. Dissemination is a broad topic. We need to support policymakers, insurers, and others to assure the availability of the best, best available treatments. And one of the things that it came out in about four or five meetings I attended is it's time we paid attention to the fact that increasingly the people who are actually providing the services in mental health centers and uh, other facilities are trained at the master's level, not doctoral trained people uh, of the sort that we were developed that, that uh, set of recommendations for. How do we get to them? How do we help them to understand what we do, how to do it, and implement that in their practice. 
We need to inform recipients of services of effective option, of, of services of what effective options are available beyond those they see hyped on TV every night over and over again. <laughs> it is a major ABCT initiative. It's something that has been rattling around the board of directors for years and that was clearly articulated by Frank in 2009. He sponsored the, uh, we sponsored the Internet Organizational Task Force that involved 15 different organizations but was sponsored by ABCT to create the doctoral si the CBT education recommendations. We felt starting at home was probably the first place to go. What we've done now is create a new task force, and I mentioned the people who are involved there, Sharon Berry is heading it, who has got a twofold charge from the board. One is help us disseminate and get that word out about the CBT uh, doctoral training recommendations. And secondly, come back to us with what? In this vast umbrella of things we include under dissemination, where do we go next? Where's the best part? Recommend to the board where we need to focus next. But the dissemination effort is a vast one, and it's one that I hope to see continue through years with a piece or two at a time that we can manage. The Workshops Plus I just mentioned. Uh, the webinars, oh, we hope to have one last year. We had three. I, I was only able to hear one, and it was ter terrific. In terms of a way to get to that same weekend workshop kind of thing, it's terrific. It's a terrific medium. And if we see the Workshops Plus model work at the convention workshops, there's no reason we couldn't also incorporate it into something like this. <clears throat> And we do have an extremely active dissemination group, uh, special interest group within the organization. We must find ways to share what we know. But in addition, we must learn how to disseminate. I like this, our, this uh, quote from McHugh and Barlow. At this critical juncture, an evidence base for the dissemination and implementation of EBPTs is lacking, and no clear consensus emerged on best practices. We are trying to disseminate using gut instincts, but that's not the way behavior therapists and cognitive behavior therapists operate. We need some data. <clears throat> Beyond one-to-one -one therapy, some have argued that we rely too heavily on one-to-one -one individual treatment. I'm not sure that's true. Oops. Alan Kazin, in his address upon receiving the James Cattell Career Achievement Award from APS, and I under, I'm, I'm betting, I was not able to hear his invited address here, but I'm betting these themes were, were echoed. The kind of work that I've been doing, and what I dot, dot, dotted there is, uh, and for which I'm probably receiving this award, is work that is not needed anymore, should not be done, is not solving much of the serious problem, the serious problem being reducing the overall impact of mental illness. My view is that psychosocial interventions as currently studied, practiced, researched, and delivered will just not have an impact on mental illness in this country. I, and this is the one that will probably plague him for the rest of his career. If the goal is to reach a small number, to exclude those in need, particularly those in minority groups, particularly those in rural areas, especially those who are elderly, and especially those who are young, if that is our goal, we're doing great. <clears throat> and the last, or another one from Alan's address, in reducing the burden of mental illness, epidemiology and public health are our partners. They focus on risk, they focus on pre prevention and population-based interventions. One more quote. <clears throat> Throughout history, the field of public health has long known that no mass disease or disorder has ever been eliminated or significantly reduced by attempts at treating the affected individuals. One-to-one -one treatment doesn't cut it. Psychotherapy is futile. Only successful primary prevention reduces incidence, but clinical psychologists do not know this. Is that from Kasdan? George Alvey, in 1998, and he was recounting a physician that he had taken for a good 40 or 50 years before that point. This is not news, but it's time, and Alan is correct, we need to start taking it seriously. We need to start not abandoning individual treatment. Um, <laughs> Alan, again, struggled with the another psychological organization that thought he had put down individual treatment totally. I don't think so, and that's not where, certainly where I'm coming from. In fact, I talked to him about it. He said, I didn't say that. <coughs> but I think if we see individual or successful prevention and early detection programs, 
the need for individual treatments that may be more potent, more easy to control, should be reduced greatly. And Kelly Brownell at this convention, there's a balance to be struck between educating and imploring people to change one at a time versus changing policies that create better food environments for millions of people at a time. My conclusions from this, if we are going to impact the overall burdens of psychological and behavioral problems, we can't rest on individual therapy alone. We must take Allen's charge seriously, develop alternative means of delivering those services. Critically important are effective programs of primary and secondary prevention. <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure when we started, but I'm afraid I'm going to run a bit over time, so I'm going to skate through this a little bit clearly. Uh, I've stole these slides from a number of different presentations that were co developed by uh, members of the active duty Air Force, especially Dr. Wayne Talcott and Dr. Richard Campisi. Um, but I am responsible for the content I'm presenting, not the Air Force and not these individuals. And it's a description of the Air Force Suicide Prevention Program. This is why it was started. From 1991 to 1995, they saw a rise in suicides in the Air Force. And what could we do about it was the question. The problem in doing anything about it is that we are talking about 350,000 people who are stationed worldwide, all over the place. <clears throat> There's a high turnover in personnel, so you don't have them available for much. Uh, the average enlistment is four years at a time, and the people running the show, their average place of, of deployment where they work is likely to be about four years, and then they move to another place. Suicide is a low base rate occurrence to start with, so it's hard to get enough of the sample to study and try to figure out what to do. Air Force oh yeah, I mentioned that. Virtually, uh, it's virtually impossible to predict suicide in the individual case, but perhaps from a public health perspective, from a population health perspective, one can say, what can we do to reduce the incidence overall? Their vision, and I put that emphasis in myself, this, the assumptions that were made before we began was suicide prevention is a community responsibility. It is not a mental health problem. It is a community responsibility, and that mental health providers are a part of that community. Leadership involvement is essential for success. If we had tried to do this without a letter from the Surgeon General of the Air Force and another letter from the Air Force Chief of Staff saying, this is important, we really want to see this done and we'll support you, what we would have gotten is, you don't think we're busy enough already and we got to do this stuff too? But what we got instead was, okay, if it's that important to the Air Force, let's give it a shot. <clears throat> the focus was on early identification and early intervention which required what much wider spread community knowledge and skills that existed at the time. I'm not going to dwell on these 11. I'm going to go through them one at a time. There were 11 initiatives that emerged from the, the uh, planning of the program. I mentioned leadership involvement already. They needed to be visible to the community in their leadership and support of the program. <clears throat> Suicide prevention education was included in all formal military training. If you're going to be promoted, from uh, captain to uh, the next rank, you have to take certain military education requirements about the military, about the Air Force, about how the system works. And in every case, we had suicide prevention briefings included in that training. Commanders received training on how and when to use mental health services and when to employ other community resources and their role in encouraging early help-seeking behavior. One of the principles was, again, early detection and early intervention, but that doesn't mean necessarily early intervention by a psychologist. We had research that we had done that showed what the risk factors were for suicide in the Air Force, and they're identical to those you would see in the, in the civilian sector. But we know if a person is in trouble with the law or with the Air Force reg regulations and the, the, punitive, the, the system, uh, that's one risk factor. Marital problems, financial problems. So if you have these things developed, early detection, don't just let it fester. Respond to it, and if it comes to the commander's attention, and the commander is now being held responsible to make sure these things get done since it's a community problem, <clears throat> you may not want to refer them to a, a, a mental health professional. You may want to refer them to a lawyer if they're in legal problem, trouble. You may want to refer them to a, 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 a financial counselor if they're having money problems. You, know, you may consider sending them to, and here's when to do each. 
The assumption again was that community prevention efforts are as important as treating individual patients with mental health problems. We provided mental health professionals with resources and training. Uh, it's a wonderful package that was developed for the providers, the mental health providers. It started off with, these are 16 things you ought to do in a screening. The second section, just a list. The second section developed each of those. The third one talked about the interventions in there. And the fourth one showed the, the references and the research supporting the recommendations. And we also put, emphasize that mental health professionals need to get, not only worry about that aspect of things in their offices, but get out of their offices and become more involved in, hum in community efforts, training those around them what to look for, when to alert someone that there's a problem. I'm going to be very brief about this. If there's any investigative interview, if a person is in legal trouble and is investigated, the notion is hand it off to somebody in that person's community where they live so they know something's going on. Every person in the Air Force, including those of us who developed the program, had to take annual training in suicide prevention. A trauma stress response team, teams were established to respond to traumatic incidents and one of the things they worry about is the effect it has on the people who are surviving. There was an agency created called the Community Action Information Board to coordinate the activities of agencies like the financial assistance, child care, mental health services, legal services, and make sure that they were talking to one another and available to the people who might want to make referrals. <laughs> I like this one. The consultation assessment tool allows commanders to assess unit strengths and identify areas of vulnerability. This slide was presented to senior uh, officers in the Air Force. You don't require them to do things, you allow them the capabilities. <laughs> but in point of fact, they were required annually to look at those 11 initiatives and to report how much compliance there was on their base and their community. <clears throat> and finally, there was a suicide surveillance system which, create, which was created that tracked in detail suicidal attempts and suicide, successful suicides. The program was initiated in that vertical dotted line in, 2000, or in 1994, and you can see the, the effects that it had until 2002. This community approach, and I think, again, one of the most important parts of it was demedicalizing and depathologizing uh, the, the uh, concerns and involving people who can deal with the risk factors rather than simply dealing with the effect of those risk factors. <clears throat> um, so it, things are looking good as of 2002. There was a study done of, uh, looking at our data and combing through the data by Knox et al, and they came to these conclusions in 2002. Their conclusions in that article were these. Oh, that second one needs a little bit of explanation. In addition to tracking suicide, as long as we have a database set up, they also track other incidents, family violence, uh, other kinds of problems that occur with some frequency in the Air Force. And what was found was there were reductions in those areas as well. The same systems were being used to approach those problems even though they weren't the target of the training. However, comma, in 2004, that would be the last two dots on the right of that curve. We see a return to 13.1 suicides per 100,000 people, which was about the same as the average before the program was implemented. Now that's a bummer. <clears throat> So what they did is they said, what's going on? They did a survey. Are you folks really doing what we said we ought to be doing, or are you not? And if you're not, let's get with it and do that. Get back to, the, get back to it. And here's what was found. When they did this initial survey uh, under uh, calendar year 04, those are the compliance rates with the 11 initiatives. After saying, hey, shape up, we're in trouble again, the, uh, com the uh, compliance rates were up near 100%. What happened then? <clears throat> this is from the year of 2004 by quarter, the year of 2005. Now, if it hadn't been something in the phenomenon that, that uh, 
dictated when we made that reversal. It would be a beautiful reversal design. At most, it's a quasi-experimental design, but there's some credibility to saying that program had some effect. And here are the data. <clears throat> the, 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 the second dotted line on the right is the 2004, and you can see the data afterwards. The rates dropped from 13.1 to 9.9 .9 per 100K. Now, those may not sound like huge numbers, but again, if you look at things from a community, I'm sorry, uh, a public health perspective, small changes as a result of, mi of minimal efforts are really what you're looking at. We would not have had that kind of change if we had poured resources and time and trouble into individually treating uh, people through the mental health system. <clears throat> I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip over these. Uh, yeah, this is worth talking about. Okay, the Air Force is admittedly a unique population. But there's no reason and there's nothing inherent in this program that precludes it from being used in other closed systems, like a university campus or a business organization. They could be used and could be applied with modifications appropriate to the setting to those other places as well. Here's the bad news. What happened since 2008? The bottom line is I tried to find out, I don't know. My guess is that as happens often, once the problem is reduced, it falls off the radar screen because other things loom, like wars, and begin to take more attention from people than the suicide prevention that we had done so well. There's also turnover. Those people who had the fire in the belly who pushed this and, and championed it and managed it moved on to other jobs, retired from the Air Force, et cetera. And likely, I would be w willing to bet, there would probably be a repeat of the earlier failure once adherence to the program stopped to the pre-program suicide rates. So that's kind of discouraging. <clears throat> this was an NIMH report looking at our data in 2008. And I think that's a quite reasonable assumption. The program cannot be maintained by inherent momentum. It requires continuous implementation efforts and ongoing monitoring. Is that unique? Gordon Paul, in the uh, late 70s, conducted a, a, a community program, so to speak, in the back wards of a, of a state hospital, the most difficult to deal with patients in the system. Got incredible results in terms of quality of life, Discharge rates, reduction in recidivism, it was a roaring success about every measure one they took. <clears throat> the program ended, the grant stopped, they moved out two years later, there was no evidence that it had happened. And there has been no recovery since. That hospital is running the way it did before the program. We even see in something as simple to do as vaccinations, periodically there are outbreaks of diseases that are fully controlled by vaccinations. Recovery in those cases is usually pretty good. Uh, get back on the vaccination wagon and it, it works. There are also su success, successes, I can't go into any detail, but the Air Force way back in 1999 rolled out a program to integrate psychological services into primary care medical clinics. It worked like a charm and it's still working. It's so much a part of the culture now, nobody thinks of it as anything special. And it has been obviously uh, looked at now since that time in a lot of different areas. Why the difference? Why did this one catch on and that, those others didn't? I have lots of speculations and I may be right on some of them. I have no data. What I think we showed is an effective alternative delivery or prevention program can be developed even in a large and complex community like the Air Force and with a target that is extremely difficult to attack. While the Air Force is unique in many ways, there's no reason it can't be exported to other closed communities. Information to guide the design, implementation, and maintenance of such programs more effectively, more efficiently, and cost-effectively is lacking. We need an Alan Marlack to help us understand and overcome relapse at the program level, just as he helped articulate relapse at the patient level. <clears throat> this one's short. Uh, it's almost a, like a footnote to the talk. But as we look at new ways of stretching out, creating new delivery programs, uh, finding new treatment methods that we haven't even thought of yet and developing them based on principles that we've developed. Um, be sure that what you're doing is based on what you know as a cognitive and behavioral therapist. Why is that important? 
And that's, ba that's in our mission statement, as I, told, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> Some behavior change strategies fall beyond our scope and should. We, I don't recommend that we launch into surgery of the brain and spinal cord. It doesn't draw on behavioral principles. Rests on a body of science outside most CBTers' training. Requires knowledge and skill sets outside most of our background. That's kind of ridiculous, huh? How about this one? Prescribing psychoactive drugs. Does not draw on behavioral principles. Rests on a body of science outside most CBTers' training and requires knowledge and skill sets outside most CBTers' backgrounds. And obviously, this doesn't apply to the psychiatrists among us. <clears throat> the background that people have in prescribing professions is very different. The training is very different at each step. Prerequisites to entering the program, the contents of the program, and the continuing education and, and sharpening of skills that follows it. I'm only going to show you the prerequisite data here that I think is instructive and is consistent with the rest of the picture. These are the number of hours in uh, various um, hard sciences and uh, um, biological sciences required in other prescribing professions. I didn't put a column for psychology on there, but we'll look at psychology in a moment. But just get it, you can scan those numbers and the, the, uh, the sum, the total numbers are right in the uh, heading. How about psychology? <clears throat> See, Krista and Cohn asked this question in a, in a research study. They looked at 168 PhD and PsyD programs. Now, admittedly, this is back in 94 and 95, but I have no reason to suspect much difference today. Three programs mentioned life sciences prerequisites at all. One program required 18 credits in life sciences. One required one in biology, one in math, three in physics or chemistry, quotes, one of which may be replaced with a course in anthropology, philosophy, or sociology. Third one required 30 credits in the physical, biological, and social sciences, which of course includes psychology. It's different. We, one can argue whether it's better or worse. It's different. We don't have the same training and that the people who are doing the prescribing do. If we offer it in graduate school, do we now increase our, uh, our uh, length of time to the degree to eight years? Um, how are you going to deal with this? Elaine Hybe put it nicely. Psychologists in general are competent. Those interested in prescribing may currently do so by completing training in nursing or medicine. Of course, they must meet those prerequisites. Psychologists are not currently trained in medicine, and to do so would overhaul the discipline at the undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral level. Psychology's unique competence is the development of empirically supported psychosocial interventions for the alleviation of human suffering, and I would add, extrapolating that to new service delivery mechanisms. <clears throat> Dick McFall argues, opponents of prescription privileges for psychology legislation have provided a long list of reasons why it's a bad idea. I agree with these reasons. However, the main thrust of my argument here is simply that the proposed legislations would move us farther away from where I think we should be and not closer. And where he thinks we should be is where you and I think we should be. Here's where more information can be had. One of the biggest proponents of prescription privileges is Pat DeLeon. And if you, if you do a Google search for prescription privileges in his name, you'll find a lot. Similarly, on the other side, use Hybe or Robiner. There's also a special issue of the Journal of Clinical Psychology and a website from psychologists opposed to prescription privileges for psychologists, or POP. Um, and you click on resources from the main page, and there's a lot of readings there on the, on the con side. A little bit of truth and uh, full disclosure, I'm a member of the advisory board uh, of that organization. There are three other past presidents of ABCT on that board, and two of us are active in the current board of directors of ABCT. We are not speaking, I am not speaking for ABCT, but clearly there's some support from people who think like we do. <laughs> what I'm arguing here is, I mean, we, you know, to, to really do a, a fair job of looking at the pros and cons of this kind of extrapolation would be way beyond anything we have time for here. But what I do think it suggests, and what I'm very comfortable in suggesting to you, is look, as you're thinking about stretching out into new areas, is it consistent with the training, the attitudes, the approach that I'm trained in as a professional, or is it not? There's what we talked about.
And what can keep us from following these guidelines and others you may develop that will be even more apt, which my daughter Terry would argue? What can keep us from doing that? Only us. It's in your hands, not mine, yours. Can we show the same enthusiasm, the same energy, the same creativity, the same rigor in approaching the challenges that face us for the next 47 years? If we can, we're guaranteed to get there. If we can't, a really important development in our culture is going to fade away. I had a lot of quotes and a lot of uh, references. Um, I intentionally did that so the presentation is more portable. If you'd like to uh, get copies, there's how to get reprints. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you for your attention. Now go out and have a great time at the party tonight, and then tomorrow soak up what, what you can that's left of the presentation, then go out and build us a better cognitive and behavior therapy system and better ways of delivering those services. I didn't get to, have to wrap the gavel last year because I was sick at home with pneumonia, so I'm going to enjoy this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.